Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and we are going to talk about naming molecular or covalent compounds. All right. Covalent compounds. Now, when we're learning how to name covalent compounds, generally in beginning chemistry we think about two different things. We think about binary covalent compounds, which is what we will exclusively think about in the context of general chemistry. And then there are organic compounds. Organic compounds, um, well actually binary, chem binary compounds we do in general chemistry one, organic compounds we do in general chemistry two, um, but you may also do organic compounds in organic chemistry, should you have the joy and bliss of going on in chemistry. But binary uh, is really where we're going to focus this particular moment. Organic compounds, there are a series of video lectures on that. I am plan on reiterating them on YouTube, um, but that takes a lot more work, so <laughs> we're going to do the binary first. All right, so what does binary mean? Binary means that there's two elements within this compound. That's pretty exclusively what this means. Two elements. Those two elements have to be nonmetals for this to work. Okay, so actually they don't have to be nonmetals, but the vast majority of the time they are. Okay, so if they're nonmetals, then what we're really talking about is not an ionic bond at all anymore. It's not an ionic compound because you don't have the ionic bond convention going on. Remember, ionic bonds or where you have electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged particles, in this case ions. Here, that doesn't work at all because nonmetals generally form minuses, anions, and because they generally form anions, they uh, have no reason at all to hook together in the same convention that ionic charges do. Okay, so this is the idea behind opposites attract and like charges repel, so there has to be an entirely different convention for how these are held together, and indeed that convention is covalent bonding, right? So that was in the intro video. I'm not gonna reiterate that forever. What we really wanna get to is we really wanna get to what these look like and how to name them. All right, so if you're going from the formula to the name and you have multiple nonmetals, okay, you have, uh, actually you have two nonmetals, okay? Then the first element you're gonna name from the periodic table name from periodic table. So the second element, you're going to get the name from the periodic table, drop the ending and add an IDE. So that's a little bit of a step process. And in this case, what that feels like is that feels very much like representative metals and monoatomic anions or nonmetals. Okay, so same exact process, it feels very much the same. The problem comes in here that when you do an ionic compound, is it is inherent in the name how many of each there are. So let's take a moment here and talk about calcium sulfide. All right, if I have the name calcium sulfide and I want to go to the formula, first thing that I would have to ask myself is I would have to say, is this ionic, covalent, or an acid? It is ionic. The reason why I know it is ionic is because it has calcium, which is a metal in front. If it is ionic, to get to the formula, you must go through the ions. You don't really have a choice. So you need to look up calcium, and you look, need to look up something on the periodic table that ends with... Uh, that doesn't end with IDE, sorry, that it begins with sulf, right? And the only thing that begins with sulf is sulfur. So you look at those two. Those are both in the tall parts of the periodic tables, groups 1 and 2 and 13 through 18. So we should know what these charges are. 
Calcium is in group two, so it gets a plus two. Sulfur is in group 16, so it gets a minus two. And if I am going to balance the charges of these, right, so that my overall charge of the compound is zero, then I get CAS because they're already the same number with opposite signs. Okay, so calcium sulfide. When I write down the name cal calcium sulfide, I know how many of them there are of each. When I write down the name, for instance, sulfur oxide, that really is interesting because like we said before, if you wrote down sulfur, sulfur would be a minus two. Oxide, you would look at the periodic table, look for something that begins with ox. The only thing that's there is oxygen, that is also a minus two. A minus two and a minus two have no reason to hold together. So because they have no reason to hold together, there's a different kind of naming going on. It's different kind of bonding. Okay, and the problem with this is that this doesn't tell me much because indeed there are several compounds formed between sulfur and oxygen. These are only two of them, okay? But there are several more. You could do S2O3, so on and so forth, okay? So because of this, this is a fundamental problem because I cannot tell from this name how many oxygens I'm supposed to have which is why we use Greek prefixes, okay? For this one, this would not be sulfur, neither of these would be sulfur oxide. This would be sulfur dioxide, and this would be sulfur trioxide, okay? So it is really fundamentally important to recognize that that name doesn't fly. You can't do that. Okay, and you must use Greek prefixes to tell how many of each atom you have. You guys see that? Yep, awesome. Oh, squeaky, squeaky. All right, use Greek prefixes, pre Greek prefixes to tell the number of each atom in the formula. Notice that for both of these, there was only one S, and because there was only one S, I didn't put a mono in front of that. I just dropped it, okay? That's very different from if there's, and by the way, I'm going to get rid of organic here. Organic is for another time, okay? Um, if I were going to have S2O3 as I was talking about, right? Then here, you really do have to say how many of each there are, right? So in this case, it's not enough to just put sulfur in front and trioxide on the back because then if you name this sulfur trioxide, how am I supposed to know that this is different from that? You can't, right? The, the, by the name, they're the same. And this actually is sulfur trioxide. So what am I gonna name this? Well, I'm gonna tell you how many sulfurs I have in front, which makes it disulfur trioxide. Slightly different, but really informative when I'm looking towards doing the name. All right, until I see you again, adieu.